Okay, so now on to the main event. Um, I'm really delighted and thankful that uh, Dr. Natalie Bean is joining us today. She is a superstar biostatistical epidemiologist, and she is a member of the Twitterati. Anyone know what that is? That's like the, the A-list Twitter users that other people follow. Um, she was trained as a biostatistician at Boston University and Harvard University. Her expertise is in designing studies to test uh, vaccine efficacy, and she's worked really close with the WHO um, to support the design of vaccine trials for HIV, Ebola, during the 2015 West African epidemics, Zika, and now COVID. Um, she has been so, in, in addition to Twitter, she's been so prolific recently. She recently had a piece in New England Journal of Medicine about how to do randomized uh, clinical trial interventions for dynamic and uncertain emerging threats like Ebola and, and COVID. She had a piece with Carl Bertstrom in the New York Times on how we should really be thinking about herd immunity and overshooting it uh, with current uh, epidemic dynamics. Um, she's a collaborator on a study looking at impacts of social distancing, contact tracing isolation in Boston, a study on household transmission rates and risk factors in uh, Guangzhou, China. Um, and that's just part of the list of her recent contributions. And as I mentioned, um, she, she has this amazing Twitter channel. I'm not sure if that's the right lingo, but she's on Twitter. And on a daily basis, she provides deep diving and pithy commentary that touches on recent publications and preprints, ideas, world events, and really gives us all sort of good situational awareness and interesting and, and useful framing for understanding and working towards solutions to this unprecedented threat. So, so glad to have you here today, Dr. Dean, um, to discuss with us, tell us about what's on your mind. And that, Thanks, yeah, I'm happy to be here. I'm a big fan of, of your work and your group's work. So this is neat. So yeah, so my research focus is really about um, vaccine study design. So I've been focusing on clinical trial design adapted for outbreaks. Um, that's what I've been doing for the last few years since I uh, worked on an Ebola vaccine trial in Guinea um, during that West African epidemic. And since then, we've been thinking more generally, been working with the WHO's blueprint to strategize the design for vaccine trials, um, just more generally for, for, for outbreaks. And, uh, and so now I'm working with the WHO on their solidarity multi-country vaccine trial. So that is not actually what I plan to discuss. So <laughs> I plan to discuss something that I just saw on the internet and um, I just thought was interesting and just as a way to kind of share interesting ideas with other folks, um, just things that I'm curious about. So let me get my, I made a few slides because I like pictures. And so let me figure out how to get that up. Okay, can you see the slides? Yes, okay. So, um, so a short summary of something I'm interested in. <laughs> so I want to talk today just about Japan because Japan is a very curious country just in what's happened there. And I think a lot of people are, I, I expect to hear a little bit more about this in the news. There have been, there's been some recent reporting, but Japan has taken a different tack from other countries. I'm very, just in general, I'm very interested in learning from other countries because all, you know, the whole world is trying to figure out how to deal with this problem right now in a million different ways. And it, we can look to other places that are having success and see what we can adopt. I mean, maybe we can't directly adopt the same strategy, but we can, we can identify kind of the best parts of it and, and try and use those. So Japan has been unusual because they haven't used a lot of testing and they really haven't locked down in the same strong way that other countries have. Um, they have definitely had changes to their, you know, everyday, um, like schools just closed a little bit early, um, but then a lot of things have stayed open a lot more than in other places. And yet we see that their epidemic curve has come back, um, has come down over time. So the question is, what is going on here? So what can we look at uh, in, in Japan's strategy and what can we learn? So one thing you know, that I think has been really important is they've had very clear public health messaging and they were really ahead of the game. Um, even from, this is you know, from March, identifying that the biggest source of transmission seemed to be in closed spaces with poor ventilation, crowded places with many people nearby and close contact settings such as close range conversations. So they've had very clear public health mes messaging here um, in English version, avoid the three C's, uh, that 
that, you know, now we're talking about these things, but they were ahead of us <laughs> in communicating that clearly. And then have also had very good public health messaging about, you know, activities, how, you know, risk reducing activities um, that allow people to still, you know, engage with the economy, get their medical services, but ideally have some of them be, re you know, remote or uh, just encouraging people to, to take um, adopt risk reducing behavior. So education is something I'm very interested in and clear public health messaging. Um, so that that could be one explanation for why they uh, why they've they've done well. Certainly the public is more um, engaged and and also you know, there's a lot of mask wearing because of seasonal uh, allergies. So people are very used to to wearing masks. So we don't really understand exactly the role of masks, but that certainly um, could contribute. So another thing that I've found very interesting is. Um, is the potential role of uh, so over dispersion in these number of secondary cases and potential sort of super spreading events. Um, so certainly with SARS, that was something that was observed and I read an old paper from, from Lauren about this. Um, and and uh, so, so the basic idea is, you know, why has um, growth been so explosive in certain places, even though there are, you know, if you look, there are many people who don't go on to infect anyone else. And so in order for um, growth to sort of persist, to have a particular uh, R0 um, where, where most people are not infecting anyone else, then there may be some people where there, you know, or some situations that are leading to these big clusters where there are uh, large numbers of secondary infections. So this is um, an informal translation that someone sent me. It's not official, uh, but a translation of, of, a, of an official document um, that's put out by the Japanese government. And so there's a recent paper coming out of that, that group um, from Japan as a preprint. And so, you know, there's more and more data emerging that are consistent with this idea that there that many um, Many people are, are, there are no secondary infections resulting. Uh, so there are uh, zero secondary cases for a primary case, but then there are some, there, there's, there's a tail here. Um, and that's particularly occurring when the primary cases, there, there's some closed environment that's leading to a lot of secondary transmission. So the question then is, you know, trying to understand what are the mechanisms for why this over dispersion is, is occurring. And there was a nice preprint that came out um, that sort of tried to dissect this a little bit, the potential mechanisms. So there may be individuals that have much higher viral load. Then, you know, when we think about models, often we think about sort of heterogeneity in the number of contacts, um, you know, assuming that we have some sort of fixed number of contacts. Some people just have more contacts than others. Well, that would allow them to spread to more other people. Uh, but then, I, you know, I'm very interested in these other, these other two points. So here that we have these sort of high risk settings, these facilities like uh, nursing homes or prisons, meatpacking plants, is there something unique about these settings that is leading to a lot of transmission? Because we're seeing these explosive outbreaks here. So with meatpacking plants trying to understand is there something about the fact that it's refrigerated and people are working close together and that something with the ventilation system, you know, there are a lot of scientific questions I think are, are open here. And then we're seeing these sort of opportunists, what they call opportunistic scenarios. So these temporary situations where a lot of people join together and there may be a lot of talking or singing. Uh, um, so churches, we've seen several large church outbreaks that may have to do with the fact that there's a lot of, um, yeah, singing and, and bars or people have to talk loudly or cruise ships are a whole sort of unique situation in and of itself. So I'm very interested in investigating these um, potential mechanisms and trying to understand exactly what is the, the biological reasons that are driving these, this, this tail here. Um, so, uh, so one thing from this uh, that I thought was very interesting in the Japanese strategy is that they they talk about how they use tracing. So they use a lot of contact tracing and they use it, um, the focus for tracing is on clusters and trying to detect clusters. 
And so the way they describe, I'm still trying to understand exactly how this differs from normal tracing, but the way they describe it is in normal tracing, we're trying to identify who are the people someone's in contact with and then to isolate them to prevent forward infection, to prevent further infections. Um, whereas in Japan, what they're really focusing on is looking backwards to try and find a common source and then from that common source, identify all of these other outgrowths from the cluster. So it's a subtle difference, but the way they describe it is that if you see cases popping up in the same area, assume that they are somehow linked and see if you can investigate to identify uh, a common source. And then if you can find a common source, then focusing on, you know, maybe it was a church, maybe they're connected by a church or they were in a choir group or something, then you would be more efficient looking for everyone connected to that uh, common source than trying to find, you know, look at everyone's household contacts or try, you know, try and um, chase down all these other, uh, the, the, try and chase down the context where it, it might be that there are no secondary cases. Um, so, so just to wrap up, so um, tracing is very resource intensive. It doesn't scale easily when transmission is widespread. Um, for this disease, the secondary cases may be over dispersed. There's some emerging evidence of that. And certainly that was observed with SARS. So, um, so when we think about strategies, the, in South Korea, for example, when cases surged in February, what they did is instead of trying to chase down every, um, every uh, uh, case, they focused tracing on these clusters. They focused on a large church cluster. And what they found is that the contacts they traced that were connected to the church cluster were over 80% of them with symptoms were positive. Whereas um, when they chased down the other, uh, the ones that weren't linked to the church, only 10% of those who were symptomatic were positive. So it, you know, it may be more efficient to try and if there's something unique about the setting that why these people were infected, then trying to chase down those um, cases connected to these clusters may be more efficient. So are there ways to optimize the tracing process to focus on large clusters? So that is my presentation. Just, it's, it's not my work. <laughs> it's just something I'm interested in and wanted to talk about with a smart group of people, so.